Hello, here we are. Hi, Shir, good to see Hi, you. Hi, Francesco, good to see you again. And we have a special guest. We're gonna keep her silent for a second and just uh, let people join our, our weekly webinar from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, zooming in our weekly curatorial conversations. I'm Francesco Spagnolo. And, and I'm Shir Gal Kuchavi <laughs> with you I, weekly. I it's, it's almost Halloween, we should have masks and maybe uh, change identities and be someone else. For, and scary for, backgrounds, uh, and probably. Scary backgrounds. Instead, we have backgrounds of beloved galleries that we hope at some point to reopen to the public. And today we have a special guest, Simona Dineti uh, from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, hello, Simona. Hello, Sir. Hello, Francesco. We Thank don't have you to pretend we're me. not Italian, right? So we can, we can say ciao and buongiorno. And <laughs> buongiorno a tutti. Uh, um, so like every week we broadcast from the Magnus, we focus uh, each week on a different topic. So by the time we are done with this project, we'll have quite a library of ideas, I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and people are, are still trickling in and, and joining us from home. And uh, so a few, a few rules of engagement uh, before we, uh, we start. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar. And so the videos of participants uh, are hidden. So it's only us uh, that you see presenting on, on screen. If you have any technical questions, you can use the Zoom chat. And at the chat is our colleague, Nat Unsan, and our another colleague, uh, Ross Coulter, today. And it's Nat's last day working with us. Uh, so thank you, Nat, for everything he, he has been doing. If you have any questions uh, for us, for the panelists, and stuff, you can use the Zoom Q&A. So you go to the bottom, and this is for those who are following from home, you go to the bottom of your screen and you see a Q&A uh, button and you push that and we will receive your questions. And by the end of our, our presentation, we'll be able to try to address them. And uh, so just a, a reminder, we are today uh, speaking as every week about the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley, one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world the only one at the research university, but we have another only one, the one and only uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts with, mm -hmm. with an impressive collection of, of Judaica and Simona Dineti is, uh, is the curator of the collection. And so we'll learn about this collection while we explore a very special topic. Uh, we yeah. decided to call it, decided to call it a, silence, a silent presence. Female representations in synagogue textiles. What we're looking at is uh, essentially a number of textiles that uh, are very much part of the ritual of the synagogue, but uh, typically, traditionally, they are shown in an area of the synagogue in which women are not physically allowed to be. So the name only is their presence and you know, where their voice and their actions. We'll, we'll explore this as we also explore the, the, uh, the Judaica collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, so, um, as all, all, always, we, we have a few topics we will discuss in generally in general synagogue textiles and then explore the collection Boston and finally uh, go very deep, deep into a set of specific uh, specific textiles that uh, we are presenting to you this uh, this week from both collections. So it's a it's a nice meeting, Simona. It's a nice night confluence of of ideas and and of uh, and of uh, incredible art objects. Yes. Uh, so as, as, a remember, as a reminder, what we're talking about is really the fact that uh, on synagogue textiles, which are uh, prominently displayed in the center of the action of the synagogue, there is something else. There is a presence, a presence in name only. Uh, here you see highlighted on the variety of textiles, there are Torah art curtains, Torah mantles to cover the, the, the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible. And, and also, and we'll talk in detail about this, the, 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 the Torah binders, which are used to wrap and keep the, 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 the scrolls closed when they're, when they're put away. But these binders are then unwrapped and all of these, these uh, objects that we see are displayed prominently at the core of the ritual action. And they often have uh, women's names and often they're made by women. So uh, we're eager to learn, I'm very much eager to learn from you, Shira and Simona. Uh, what you've been researching about this and what your topics are. But before we do that, let's uh, now share, introduce our guest. Yeah, let's, let's start with our partner today, with our wonderful, the wonderful Simona Dinetti. And we, it's such a treat that you're joining us today. So thank you very, very much, Simona, for making the time. 
uh, and you know, spending some time with us during the week preparing for this. So I'll just introduce Simona briefly for those of you who don't know her. Simona Di Neppi is the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Curator of Judaica at the Museum of Fine Art Boston, where she's responsible for building and displaying the collection of Jewish art. Originally, Simona is from Rome. Before moving to the United States, Simona studied and worked in London and in Tel Aviv for 25 years. She filled curatorial roles in both decorative arts and old masters at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, at the National Gallery of London, the Royal Ac Academy of Arts in London, and also worked as uh, a lecturer of, on Ital in Italian Renaissance at, in, at IDC. I apologize, in Ertelia in Israel, and as a curator in Betzit Futsot Museum, uh, the Museum of Jewish People's Diaspora in Tel Aviv. Um, Simona also wrote several accompanying publications, and I do encourage you to look for Simona and look for more information about her and her wonderful publication after this presentation. So Simona, I, let's just jump in. I'd love to, to invite you to introduce the, the beautiful collection of Judaica at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and which is so interesting because unlike our museum, you're part of a larger encyclopedic museum. So you're really a speci very specific department. So please, the stage is all yours. Yes, first of all, hello everyone from snowy Boston, if you're on the West Coast, and uh, hello Shir and Francesco, thank you very much for this invitation. You know that I'm a dedicated follower of your Friday um, talks. You yes, ask the all, museum... the, all the hardest questions always come from you. So. Exactly. <laughs> so today... I tried to, to stop with that, but... <laughs> today uh... you'll have some, <laughs> hopefully. Boston Museum of Fine Arts is one of the great encyclopedic museums in the world, I would say. It has uh, an outstanding co collection, especially in areas of uh, ancient collections of Greek and Roman and Asian and uh, Nubian and Egyptian. Um, so I warmly recommend when all of this that we're living through is over to come to Boston and visit the museum. Judaica is actually a, a fairly recent addition to our holdings. It is a young but rich and diverse collection. Um, that came, uh, most of it, seven years ago in 2013 through the generous gift of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman collection of Judaica. And I've prepared this first slide, which I'd like to find out first if I'm the only one who sees it uh, small, almost as a thumbnail. No, it's, I, I no, it's, 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 at least it's displaying well for me. It's one. displaying uh, well for me. So so me. You know, share if you want to check if there are any comments from, from home and anybody is... Uh, is okay. No. Well, so, I I know so, the work, so I that's not a problem. Slide for me. along, Simona. We're good. So the first slide is just to give you a taste of the variety, the diversity of our collection. Uh, we have paintings, and you see here probably one of our highlights, a compelling portrait by the Hungarian painter Izinor Kaufman called Hanna. We have silver mostly, and this is a spice tower, probably from Prague. We have ceramics, and we have a lovely uh, plate for Passover made in Delft in Holland. And we also have works, um, you know, textiles, and we have this charming and colorful pillow cover uh, from made by the Ethiopian. Jewish uh, community. Um, and uh, so, but I'd also like to say that if we go on to the next slide, please, that um, the Museum of Fine Arts wasn't always interested in Judaica. The Museum of Fine Arts is now 150 years old. Um, and actually, for the first 140 years of its life, it did not collect Judaica. There are probably 15 works of Jewish art that came in the museum during that period, but they were undetected, I would say, meaning that they came in as part of much larger donations uh, that were not donation of Jewish art, and they just happened to be one work of Judaica. I'll give you an example with these two works. The shofar on the left came in 1916, along with a gift of 600 musical instruments. So it wasn't really about Jewish art. And similarly, the gilded lion on the right that come from a synagogue in Boston came in with a gift over the course of many years of 5,000 works of folk art. It just happened to be from a synagogue. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please. 
we've been trying to really make up for all this lost time, 150, 140 years, um, recently in the past 10 years, and particularly in the past couple of years, we've been particularly active in purchasing, uh, in acquiring new works. And here you see, again, the diversity of the collection that we've been acquiring, just some of the examples of the works that entered the collection in the past couple of years. We're trying to compete with you with your collection of Arthur Zick. <laughs> I see it. The <laughs> left hand side, you see a book of Esther by Arthur Zick. We have here also two Ketuba marriage certificates, one from Holland, I'm sure you can spot it. Uh, the other one from Tehran, 1913. We have contemporary works by an Israeli maker with a feminist feeling. It looks more like a uh, sort of uh, silver arm bracelet. Um, and also a Hanukkah lamp from Linda Threadgill with beautiful um, flowers as, uh, uh, as really candle holders. So we've really been trying to enlarge our collection um, and make it a rich and diversified. And we go on to the next slide, please. I just want to quickly um, show you our absolute highlights of the collection. One is this Hanukkah lamp, which is actually the first work that the museum purchased in 2009, 10 years ago, ever the first work that the museum purchased, and it's a Hanukkah lamp made in Augsburg, Germany in 1750. Um, I would really highlight the fierce figure of Judith um, dangling the head of Olafurness. She's standing of, on one of the, of the uh, pilasters. Ooh. On the other one, we see uh, Judah Maccabi. Um, and uh, the next slide I will show some highlights of actually synagogue Judaica. We didn't have any synagogue Judaica until a couple of years ago. And last year we went on a shopping spree and we bought not one, but three pairs of Torah finials. It really illustrate the um, variety of visual styles. We have the pair on the left from Morocco, in the center from Germany, and on the right from England. I want to really stress the, the, the pair on the, in the center, which to the best of my knowledge is the earliest pair of Torah finials uh, in this country. Um, and I'd like to show you with my last slide for this section that we do not have a separate uh, Judaica gallery. We actually integrate our collection throughout the building, uh, placing our Judaica in galleries according to the period and region uh, when and where they were made. And here you see the, that pair of of English Torah finials in a case of liturgical um, British silver from England, Wales, and Scotland in a beautiful uh, period room of the Hamilton Palace from the 17th, uh, end of the 17th century. So this is a brief introduction of our collection. Um, Thank you, Simona. Just wonderful. And I'd love to come visit uh, once COVID is behind us. Um, Francesco, I think maybe we should start looking in synagogues and think yes. about our yes. our women. Yes, so we're, you know, and, and I just want to say Simona, Shir and I often collaborate offline. So it's a it's a delight to be uh, together on a on a panel. So uh, even though we're far away uh, and of course, we hope to get together in person soon. It's, uh, it's so good to be together today. Yes. And uh, so we're zeroing in on our topic today, which is uh, essentially the fact that synagogue textiles position women in name only at the center of the ritual action. So just, just a, a couple of, of uh, 18th century prints uh, just to remind us of what we're talking about. Uh, so we see the inside of synagogues and all of the characters, except when you see on the right, women are in the, in the women's galleries, but all of the characters around the, the core ritual action are all male figures uh, because they are the only ones who are allowed in the gender segregation dynamic of the synagogue to enter this space. However, many of the textiles that are prominently displayed when the Torah ark here on the right is open, the textiles um, covering the, the Torah scrolls or also curtains in front of the ark, etc. Uh, but also uh, prayer shawls, uh, other type of mantles uh, mm -hmm. to cover the, the, the reading podium uh, where, where the Torah is read from, etc. are often 
made and often signed by women. So we find a lot of these traces and, and sure, thank you for guiding us through some of the highlights uh, from the Magnus and then we'll integrate the conversation also with the highlights from the MFA. Yes, so I just we just selected a few examples of items from our collection that really show how these women uh, created these beautiful works, made this beautiful these beautiful embroideries. But again, they can't uh, walk physically into the space where these items are are on view to all these men uh, eventually. Uh, so this is one example from the Jewish community of Gelsenheim in Germany. And this is from 19th century, from, 1890, uh, from 1849. Um, it says on the text, uh, Gelsenheim, which is in English, um, the Women's Guild of Ger Gelsenheim. Um, in the next one, we have uh, another example of, again, the Chavrat Neshim Yeshivat Etzchayim, the Women's Guild of the Etzchayim Yeshiva, a yeshiva that was established in 19th century Jerusalem. Uh, in actually in the buildings, I think it was originally placed in the buildings around the Churva Synagogue, which is a historic synagogue that's located within the old Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. And it's a, it's a very significant place and it's a very significant and historic yeshiva. And, uh, and this beautiful curtain was created by and donated by the, the women of this community. Um, in the next couple of examples are actually, the one on your left is actually one that we're not sure about its origin, but Francesco, I think you and I both, because of the last name of the donors are thinking that it might, may have come from Spain or from well, the no, community. From the Mediterranean. Yeah, or from the Mediterranean. Spanish last name, Turiel. Turiel or Turel, uh, which we found it originated in the island of Mallorca. So Chaim and Sarah Turel, which is uh, the name, which are the names uh, of the people who donated this beautiful uh, Torah curtain to, to your uh, left. And then on your right, we actually have a Torah mantle from, uh, from Morocco. And we have another beautiful example for that, uh, for that community that was dedicated by Shlomo Akrish and his wife. Uh, so the text on this uh, on this uh, textile actually reads Zota Torah Shekdishu Hamishubach VeHachacham Kvod Harav Shlomo Akrish Yechiot Zuro VeIshto Marat Mira Minashim BeOel Tavurach. So the man and his wife, his wife's name of course is mentioned on this uh, on this Torah mantle, which is very significant uh, for us. And in the next example, again from Tangier, is from Morocco. Uh, there's, it's not actually only the men, it's actually uh, a daughter of, the daughter of Yaakov Kao, who created this, um, who is donating this beautiful Torah mantle on, in memory of her sister Zahara and her brother David. Um, so that is uh, a very interesting uh, kind of almost family history there where you see both the names of the, of the daughter, the father, and then her two siblings there who were both deceased by the time this was donated. Um, and it, we, you know, we can add the fact that these names are featured prominently. They're names of makers, of donors at times. So they actually mm -hmm. signify a level of agency. And the way mm -hmm. in which women are mentioned is, is highly significant as well. Uh, in, you know, in the ones we saw before, it wasn't just the wife of, but it was the wife of Mrs. So and so. She's mm -hmm. she's she's uh, she's treated with yes. with all the with respect. a lot of respect. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the respect. Uh, what we uh, found, and Simona helped me navigate back to our beloved Italian tradition, is that the Italian prayer book, for centuries, has included a special blessing around the time in which the, in the synagogue the Torah scrolls are brought out and so all of these textiles are prominently displayed this is kind of like essentially having one's name on these textiles is like placing an ad at a, a prime time television it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a major uh, promotional act and a major honor honor within within the economy of, of absolutely of the and so the italian prayer book honors the women who are makers of uh, of textiles and uh, I don't know if you want to uh, share you, with your beautiful Israeli Hebrew, unless we want to use our Italian Hebrew, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, read that's the first blessing at the top, uh, okay. uh, what it says. 
מי שבירך אמותינו שרה, רבקה, רחל ולאה, הוא יברך את כל בית ישראל שעושה, שעושה מעיל או מטפחת לכבוד התורה והמתקנת נר לכבוד התורה. הקדוש ברוך הוא ישלם שכרה וייתן לגמולה הטוב ונאמר אמן. So, most of the blessings recited in the synagogue refer to males. They're, in the, they're gendered in, 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 in declined in, in a male way. is we have a blessing that's recited prominently that uh, honors and prizes the, the women who are making, but also are donating uh, their time and often resources to light synagogues. So providing resources to buy and install candles for nighttime ceremonies, etc. So this is a very important signal. And we find it also manifested in Italian uh, textiles as well. Uh, this This is one from the, uh, from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Simona. Uh, do you want to tell us a, a, just a little bit about it? And I, so, I think I, I went in and highlighted uh, the, the woman's name. Here it is. Right. So the, f- first of all, I should say that this is one of the works that, that actually was in the collection before the big gift of 2013. In fact, it was uh, donated in 1895. It's interesting. And it is, um, so even though it is an Italian um, binder and it does feature the name of the donor because the translation says, uh, Mr. Ishmael Colonia, Uh, and then the acronym for May the Rock Keep Him, and his wife, Mrs. again, Marat, Esther Colonia, and then the abbreviation for Simchat Torah. So here the woman appears and does appear her name as a donor, but not as a maker. Uh, so we do not know if she made it. In fact, I actually suspect that, that she didn't. So we I are- I commissioned it along mm-hmm. with her husband. Exactly. But she's in name honored along with, uh, with her partner. Um, I, I took the liberty of going through some of the Torah uh, uh, binders in the, in the Magnus collection that come from Italy. They're all 18th century. And by the 18th century, we see that these formulas that are embroidered on, the, on these uh, textiles have changed. And there are two types. So when, uh, when it's a young woman, uh, and often it says that the inscription will say, I made this. And will sign herself as I'm, I'm a young woman and I'm the daughter of. So essentially the patronymic is essential. And, 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 uh, and her name is in this case, in a couple of these cases, Laura, Laura, daughter of Rafael Norzi, or as we see in this one, Esther Tova, again, the daughter of someone, right? And that someone is actually of the same family, uh, yeah, the color. Uh, Colonia that, that, uh, that was highlighted in, in, uh, in the MFA. So it's, a, it's maybe a little family reunion. We're talking about, <laughs> about probably Ashkenazi families uh, from Köln, Germany, in Northern Italy, but uh, the jury is still out. We're still debating this offline. And here's the example. And when, when women in the 18th century in Italy are actually somebody's wife, they sign themselves in a very different way. And I know what is this, and it seems to be pretty much a rule, at least in, in, this, in this time period, they will sign themselves with their first name, their own family name, what's in that expression that I really don't like in English, maiden name, but uh, you know what I mean. And then wife of so-and-so, here's the example. And again, here it says, you know, it's, uh, it, it was the work of my hands and my name is Mazal Tov Fano, wife of. someone else. So there, there is a sense of agency, both in the making, but also in, the, in presenting oneself in front of the whole community. When the Torah scrolls are taken out of the ark and opened up, unveiled, and, and, and this binder is, is open and essentially displayed in front of the whole community. But very much all of this, is, even though the, the makers are women, all of this is done by men. So there are interesting dynamics that go on here. Uh, we have other uh, Torah binders that are particularly interesting in, in our respective collection, Simona, and which are the, the, the so-called Vimpel. We're talking about South Germany. There are also branched out in, in Denmark, other places where some South German Jews uh, relocated. There, is, there, are, there are very special documents. There are uh, records of birth because they're created at the birth of a, of a young man. Mm-hmm. And this, again, this, this is male, male affairs. This is only on our male, male. Not, not girls. There yes. are also amulets because they have texts that will incite protection. And as we found out in our research, and I think we presented this a few weeks ago, but we'll go back to this in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, there are also 
essentially birth records and, and archival documents because they, they give us very precious information, historical information we can often not find anywhere. We're able to locate often individuals for whom these uh, textiles were created. This is one from the Magnus, which has helped us rethink the birthday of Rabbi Max uh, Lilienthal. So uh, beautifully embroidered. But what we're interested in today is the fact that even though they're made for, for, for young men, for boys, uh, oftentimes they depict women. As you see in the bottom left, uh, under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy, we see a bride. And uh, the one from the MFA, uh, Simona, if you want to guide us through it. Uh, yes, and, and, and it is true, they do depict uh, women sometimes, and we'll see it in this example, uh, this German example from the MFA that is dated to 1745, but that sense of agency of the women as both makers and donors is gone. So this example is absolutely charming, delightful, embroidered uh, example of a, of a German type of uh, Torah binder. I will translate it from, for you. Um, it's actually, uh, I don't know that we've, we've said this, but it's actually made of four strips of linen that are cut from the swaddling cloth used to wrap the baby boy during the circumcision ceremony. And it features the name of the baby, date of birth, the name of the father, and the special blessing um, said recited during the Brit Milah. This one in particular says, Meir, son of our great teacher and rabbi Yosef uh, Baro, uh, he was born on the uh, 23rd of Elul, the 20th of September, uh, 5505, 1745. And we go on to the next slide. Um, and may be raised to Torah, to Chupa, and to good deeds. And this is the, the standard uh, formula for the blessing. Uh, but besides the, the, the wonderful little scenes that I'll just briefly point of the, a child presumably opening the Torah scroll and a, a, a young child placing the Torah finials on top of the Torah scroll and various symbols um, that I won't go too much into it now, uh, we really want to look at the depiction of women here and uh, we've uh, sort of focused on the only two depiction of women on this Torah binder. So we have the bride herself uh, under the canopy and the inscription says, kol sasson ve kol simcha, kol chatan ve kol kala. So it's one of the, uh, the seventh uh, prayers, the seventh blessings blessing for, for wedding. Yeah. said during, during the, the wedding ceremony. And uh, she's wonderfully dressed in this very accurate uh, dress of the middle of the 18th century. On the right hand side, she is the symbol of the star sign of the baby, Virgo, Mazal Betula, the sign of Virgo. Uh, it's I a like to feisty think. Virgo, right? She's, uh, she's very, very assertive, feisty, right? assertive, holding her hands very securely at her waist. Absolutely. It's a great depiction. Yes. Maybe she's trying to make up for all the silent women that made um, that made this particular Torah binder. So uh, it is not the tradition that we have in Italy, but it is a valuable, very valuable historical document nonetheless. And Shira and I will cover the, 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 the topic of, uh, of Vimpel, of German Torah binders uh, in, a, in a few weeks. So we'll go deeper into this topic, but thank you, Simona. Uh, for, for, for bringing this to us and sharing uh, some of the treasures of the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, speaking of silence presences, our, our, uh, our par the participants to our webinars are, are silent, but they're asking questions. So I think there are a couple of questions here. Yes, actually. And, and uh, before you do that, I just wanna remind everybody that you can use the Q&A and we have a couple more minutes. So let's go through that. You can email us at magnus at berkeley.edu and that we'll also be back next week and we'll talk about Roman Vishnu. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, and hope you can join us then. Um, so there's one question uh, from Beth Kelman. This wimple reflects the lace making of the area, the German ones look, so I think this is actually going back to the Italian wimple examples. Yep, the German ones uh, look so different. How did they evolve so differently? I thought the German ones were made from the cloth of the birth blanket, which yes, is correct. Which is what Simona explained and will explain further when we come back to this topic. 
Uh, Simone, I don't know if you want to take this question. Why, what is the difference? Like, why is there such a difference between Italy and Germany in the making of it? Uh, sure. I, I mean, th there are uh, th those collections uh, that are very rich in Torah binders that are perfect illustration of the, you know, regional and uh, differences and the differences that evolve uh, in, in time. So, for example, Italian are perfect examples of this, because if we go back to um, our Italian Torah binder, um, we find that the very earliest uh, binders that we know from Italy, they're probably 16th century, late 16th century. We have them in Italian collection and museums are always plain, just white with lace because lace was, uh, especially in the Veneto region in, in, uh, in Venezia, but also in Florence was very much typical of the textile production of that era. So the first, sort of phase of Italian binders very much is a white um, linen fabric with, with some lace, uh, like this example. With the German ones, there's also an evolution because they go from the embroidered ones um, of the 18th century, the uh, 17th and 18th century, usually quite colorful but embroidered to the later examples we have one at the MFA 19th century and onwards very often they're actually painted painted yes and we'll we'll you know people who are asking from home we will cover this topic in a couple of weeks but mm -hmm. thank you so much uh, do we have enough we have probably we have we I don't know if we have time but we have one more question if we don't mind see what we can do with it has there been evidence of repertory or ornamental prints in the in the dotal records of Trousseau of Jewish women? I'm thinking of Italy in particular, where other types of books, medical or religious texts, appear. To my favorite, wow. to Italians. Yes, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I would say that we'll, maybe we'll post an answer if you take note of the on on social media because it's it's a loaded question and a loaded answer that will take us in a different direction. But we did want to highlight the fact that these signatures are historical documents and they highlight, uh, they're, they're, they're significant as in they highlight the role of women in society. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot to continue to discover here. And Simona, we're so grateful to you for Thank participating you so much. Thank you, Simona. In, our, in our presentation. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, we'll there is a lot more to discover. So maybe we'll, we'll be back. Yeah, again. I hope so. Thank you. I hope so too. I hope so. <laughs> thank, thank you very, you so very much. much. And uh, we'll be back next week, remember, to register and to follow us. And thank bye you, bye, Francesca, too. Have a good weekend, everyone. You bye too. Bye. Everybody, bye. yes. Take care. Bye. Bye.